JCS did a legendary video on what pretending to be crazy looks like when they looked at the case of Parkland school shooter Nicholas Cruz and his strange body language when he tried to pretend to be crazy after getting caught. But in this video, we'll be doing the opposite. We'll be looking at someone who's actually crazy but pretends to be normal. On May 26, 2014, 18-year-old Kevin Davis made a telephone call to 911 reporting that he had just murdered his own mother. He was promptly arrested and taken into police custody for interrogation. Kevin shocked the interrogators with what he revealed he had done, and you can see even the most experienced interrogators begin to break down. This is a full video of that terrifying interrogation. I'm telling you before I talk to you, we just need to read your rights, make sure you understand, you know, what, what's going on. Um, right now, you're accused of murder. You understand that? Okay. Today is uh, March 27, 2014. The time is 11:45 a.m. Your full name is Kevin Jess Jessereal Jessereal Davis. Okay, and your date of birth. Detective Ramiro Torres, Detective Richard Garcia. Okay, let's go over these rights. Make sure you understand them. First one is you have the right to remain silent. Any, any statement you make at all, any statement you make may be used against you at your trial. Understand that? Is right in here? Okay. Number two is any statement you make may be used as evidence against you in court. You have the right to have a lawyer present to advise you prior to entering any question. You understand that? Okay. Four. If you are unable to employ a lawyer, you have the right to have a lawyer appointed to advise you prior to entering any question. You understand that? And then the last one. You have the right to terminate this interview at any time. You understand that? Yeah. Can you read this out loud for me? <coughs> These rights were read or explained to me before the statement. I do hereby, knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily, waive the rights listed above. No one has threatened me, forced me, or promised me anything to make this statement. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. You can go ahead and sign it right here. David, time. Yeah. 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 Today is uh, March 27th. The time is 11.47. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you can put the time on here. It's okay. Um, oh, yeah. Put your initials by where you scratched up. Yeah, I'm not mistaken. I'm supposed to scribble on <laughs> an official <laughs> document. Hey, uh, no problem, Mr. Gordon. Just relax a little bit. What's the last time you get? Yeah, can, uh, can you put the, the year right here? Just put the 327 and the year 14 right there. Just right? so they'll know what year this is. You should read it now. Okay. Cool. Talk to some people, you want to get some stuff off your chest. Uh. Kevin is here under his own free will. Mere hours ago, he called the police with a harrowing confession, telling them that he had just murdered his own mother. The interrogators are expecting him to be cooperative, so they're being relaxed and friendly towards him. The good cop, bad cop routine is not being utilized here, as there is no need. Any aggressive tactics that would normally be used by the interrogators would only cause Kevin to close up as he's already a willing suspect. That's why they're being so friendly. They've deliberately positioned Kevin closest to the door to avoid him feeling like he's being trapped by the interrogators. Typically when interrogators want to pressurize suspects, they position them as far away from the door as possible in order to make the suspect feel like the only way out to freedom is through cooperation with the interrogators. 
They deliberately give Kevin the feeling like he is there under his own free will and that he is free to leave at any time. This is the most effective way to get a confession out of him. You know, we're here to listen to you. Why are you here? What happened? Tell us what, you know, what happened? Well, have you, has anybody gone to the house yet? Do you really? We know what happened. We have, but we want to hear it from you. Or we have an idea. You're the only one looking at us. Start at the beginning, man. What, what caused all this? Well, the very beginning, I asked my mother for permission to die, or rather kind of com commit suicide, the sort of beating around the bush sort of thing. Because, mm -hmm. well, well, that doesn't really matter why I wanted to kill myself. Sure it does. It does. I'm bored with life. I don't like life. Mm -hmm. I don't like people. I don't like living it, basically. There's really nothing, anything depressing about it. Just is what it is. And so... I wrote the note. I did. When did you write the note? Around six, 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 seven inch. Today or yesterday? Yesterday. Yesterday. Okay. That's Sunday afternoon or morning? Afternoon. Okay. Okay. And then what happened? And then... She did upset me. Kind... Well, no, actually. I molded over. And then on a whim, actually, I turned it over wrote a plan to kill both my mother and my sister, okay. quite frankly, because that's always been a thing of mine. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit of a pervert. Yeah. Um, is it like a, like a fantasy thing? And it is, mm -hmm. actually. Okay. So, that didn't happen. The best laid plans never work out, apparently, or at least the one scribbled on a piece of paper, uh -huh. uh, because she had decided she was sick of this stuff, and she was going to go send me to live with my sister again. And so I kind of leapt off in a fury and just did it right then and there. Okay. You did what? Well, I tried to strangle her with a cord, mm -hmm. a ripped cord from a video game console controller. That didn't work, huh? What was this that you thought strangle her? She was sitting on the couch okay. watching TV. Okay. That didn't work out too well. She started screaming, and so I went to her room, mm -hmm. opened a drawer at the very bottom to the right, I pulled out a hammer, I went back in the living room, and well, you kind of get the gist from there. And, uh, she was out pretty quickly, kind of tried to play dead at first, but then I finished it. So you hit her with a hammer when she was sitting in the, in the sofa in the living room? No, first I tried to strangle her, and uh -huh. that didn't work, right. so I grabbed the cord, so yes. I raced back into her room, mm -hmm. grabbed the hammer, came back out, and then did it. How many, times? How many times did you hit with a hammer in the living room? at least 20, but then she was still alive. I dragged her into the room, as you probably clearly saw, and then I picked, uh, kind of warmed my hands into her brains to kind of just, just cut it. Mm -hmm. She was still snoring. Okay. So she was still alive? She was still alive. Actually. And you went in there and you kind of grabbed those brains? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Finished it. Alright. Did you use a knife on her? Actually, I was going to, but no, I didn't get to do that. Kevin has confessed to pretty much everything the police wanted to hear, saving them a large task of slowly breaking him down over hours of interrogation and getting information. The interrogation lasts in total just over half an hour, which is incredibly short by interrogation standards. As Kevin is willingly confessing to the crime, there are little to no interrogation tactics being used by the investigators here, which is why we'll focus our analysis more on the body language and psychology of Kevin. Kevin during his trial was diagnosed by psychologists as having ASPD, which stands for Antisocial Personality Disorder, and they made effort to note that Kevin had a clear understanding of right and wrong, which may explain why he has no previous brushes with the law. If we are to understand Kevin's motives, we need to establish the symptoms of someone with ASPD. Antisocial personality disorders signs and symptoms include a disregard for right and wrong, persistent lying or deceit to exploit others, using charm or wit to manipulate others for personal gain or personal pleasure, hostility, significant irritability, agitation, aggression or violence, a lack of empathy and a lack of remorse about harming others. As the psychologist said during the diagnosis, Kevin is fully aware of right and wrong but one of the main symptoms of ASPD is a disregard for it. Kevin knows what he did was horrific, 
but he does it anyway. A deadly combination of two of the key symptoms of ASPD mixed with a perverted fantasy led to the murder of Kimberly Hill. Kevin already had a disregard for right and wrong, but the other deadly symptom is significant irritability. Kevin wanted to kill himself, and he made that very clear to his mother. And instead of consoling him and seeking him psychological help, Kimberly wanted to send him away to his sister as she didn't want the burden of looking after him. This is what likely sparked Kevin into a fit of rage and caused him to act out his violent and perverted fantasies. His closing remarks of quote, I didn't get to do that, unquote, when asked if he stabbed her, reveals just how perverted and dark his fantasies were at that point. What he said here was a clear admittance that he believes that he has some divine right to get satisfaction from his desires, even if it involves murdering his completely innocent mother. Well, did you, I guess you never got to stab her with a knife? No. It was all with a hammer? It was all with a hammer where, in my hand. And where did you hit her with a hammer? The head. All in the, all in the head area? All in the head, I believe. She, I may have gotten her hand because she was covering herself. Okay. Uh, is this uh, in the front or the, or the back of the head? Top, back, mainly. Okay. No, actually the entrance wound is around yonder somewhere here. Okay. And then, uh, so when when you dragged her to the the living room, I mean to the bedroom, you kept on hitting her there. Yeah, I kind of. That's where the uh, uh, that's when you reached in and grabbed the brain. Yeah, I kicked at it a bit. Then I just uh, that was kind of silly, but then yeah, I just decided to reach in and kind of just just do it. Mm -hmm. And then what did you do after that? Then I had sex with her corpse. You did. Mm -hmm. Did you come inside her? I did actually. Have you ever done that before? Like had sex with her? No, I haven't, actually. This is just the first time? Oh, yeah, I lost my virginity to a corpse. Okay. Uh, did you change in the bathroom? Did you? I did. I even, I took a bath before then. My penis, really, well, that's a little personal, but, yeah, mm -hmm. I needed to clean it off. And so, um, and then I, then I changed, yeah. Okay. Kevin, despite openly admitting that he had sex with the corpse of his mother, still adheres to social norms and refrains from talking further about his genitalia for privacy reasons. He is more concerned about his own dignity and self-image than he is of the horrific acts he had just committed. And up until this point, Kevin has been totally devoid of all emotion when talking about what he did to his mother. Pacifying behaviors are controlled by the limbic system, the part of the brain that regulates and controls our reaction to emotions. And we give them off when experiencing stress or overwhelming emotion. Common pacifying behaviors include scratching, fidgeting, rapid head and eye movement, and many more niche behaviors. Body language experts look for these behaviors to gauge the emotion of a suspect. Kevin gives off very little pacifying behaviors, even when discussing the extremely immoral crimes he committed. This suggests that Kevin is devoid of any feelings of guilt or remorse. Remember, one of the main symptoms of ASPD is a lack of guilt. They know something is wrong, but feel no guilt in doing it. It's why he shows more concern about protecting his own privacy as talking about his private parts would be improper than he is for the crime of murdering his own mother and then raping her corpse. He genuinely feels more concern for his own privacy. This is where the title of the video comes into play. Kevin tries to appear as if he's a normal, ordinary person, attempting to protect his own privacy and making great effort to come across as proper and reasonable. The way he talks about the horrific crimes he committed with such a calm and respectable tone with a precise attention to detail shows that Kevin has learned from the process of social conditioning to act like a normal, sane and ordinary person despite being one of the most depraved, impulsive and cold-blooded humans in the world. This is what pretending to be normal looks like. Uh, how about your sister? What's your sister's name? Uh, Desiree Hill. Is she okay? She is okay, yeah. Okay. Where does she live? At an apartment actually very near here. Um, that big kind of Hispanic thing, I mean like Spanish looking building. Mm -hmm. It's an old apartment complex with a code. Was it a, a fantasy of yours to kill her as well? It and was. did you write down that on, on your note? Oh, I did actually, but I decided against it because, well, I had my fill of killing. I didn't seem a little much. Mm -hmm. 
a little too excessive. Yeah. So, uh, so after you uh, you went in and you killed her, and you made sure that she was dead by grabbing her brain, and moving it around. Uh, then you took her clothes off, or, or was she already? Uh, uh, actually, I had to drag her by her clothes to get her in there. It was very laborious, actually. Mm -hmm. she's, she's a pretty big woman, she's heavy. Yeah. Hey, is she your natural mother? Biological yeah. mother? Yeah, actually, she is my natural mother. Mm -hmm. I take after my father. Okay. Hey, what what kind of thrill did you get by uh, having sex with her? I had always loved my mother, I guess, in the wrong sort of way, but a kind of love, I guess. Maybe some rage. Okay. Maybe just a little. Is it a Freudian style? Freudian? Uh, I kind of get where you come from. Sure. Why not? Yeah. All right. Um, have you killed anybody else before? I have not. You just fantasized about it? I just fantasized, yeah. Okay. What, what got you to this point? Tell us about what got you to this point. Did you hate life? You wanted to commit suicide. Oh, what did you say about it when you told her you wanted in a run about to commit suicide? Did she say no? She said yes. What uh, did she say to you? She said, um, basically, I'm a grown man, and what I do, I, she can't really stop me. She was, and no, she was distraught over it, of course. I mean, she, of course, of course. Yeah, she said she'd cope with it. I mean, if you kill him, that's kind of why she wanted me to go away. Why she called my sister to come pick me up, and that's kind of why I just left. So you, at that point, you got pissed? Not necessarily. I just knew it was time to act now, now or never. How, how long have you had these thoughts you went? It's around my preteens, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you ever seek uh, any kind of atten me uh, medical attention, psychological? Uh, and you feel that you can cope with that? Yeah. Nope, I never really seek help, actually. Mm -hmm. I just accepted it as a part of me. I wasn't really ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. It just was what it was. Uh, what kind of, well, let's talk about the notes that you wrote. Uh, how many notes did you write? Three. Three. Uh, there was one in the living room. Yeah. That one was addressed to who? Desiree, my sister. Because mm -hmm. I knew she would, uh, she's a good girl, but rather sensitive. I, mean, I knew she would lose her head if she kind of saw that. Do you remember what the note said? Uh, keep your head. Hurry. She might still be alive, although I highly doubt it in parentheses. Mm -hmm. Something along those lines. Yeah. Sincerely but when you wrote the note, you knew your mom was already dead? Oh, yeah, I yeah. knew it. And, you know, so you're just messing with, with Desiree by writing that, that she might still be alive? Yeah, in my sick sense of humor, okay. I was pretty well off my rocker by then. All right. And then there's a second note in, 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 in your mom's bedroom. What did that one say? Do you remember? Chase me. Was that addressed to the police or, or to who? I, I was just in a, I was in a very playful mood at the time. Okay. I just, well, I just wanted to run. Just wanted to see how far I could get. But yeah. So what? Uh, <sighs> your plan was to leave town. <sighs> or what? Uh, according to one of the notes that you wrote. Oh yeah, but a bus, yeah, the gray, bus. the Greyhound bus. Mm -hmm. I was gonna try to get out of the state or anything okay. really. But I guess something else happened. You ended up at somebody's house. No, what actually. What happened? <laughs> I told you my plan was foiled because she wanted. <coughs> She talked to me, she said my sister's going to come pick me up now, like mm -hmm. in a few minutes, uh -huh. go live with her, and that's when I said it's time to act, okay. now or never. Oh, I see. I just went over the, to their house to use <coughs> their phone, and then they wanted, I was using their phone, so I thought I might as well tell them when they asked me mm -hmm. questions. I mean, they had questions, I'm using their phone. And Where was this at? Where did you end up at? Ultimately, I ended up in the backwoods of a ditch. Here in town or out of town? Um, Robstown. In Robstown. How did you get over there? In Corpus Christi, I biked halfway, and then I got to the train tracks, and then I ditched the bike in the thick woods, and then from the train tracks, I just walked. To Robstown? Yeah. Okay, and then you came up to the, was it like the first house that you saw, or how did you, oh, how did you go to this house for, to ask to use the phone? Initially, my plan was just to run, run, run as far as I can, but then I ended up crying my eyes out in like the thick woods, like, oh, uh, what did I do? And I realized, oh, mm -hmm. you don't know what you lost till you've already lost it. And so I just, I knew that my life wasn't going to go anywhere, not anymore. So I just kind of 
gave it up midway. Mm -hmm. uh, so so you, but what brings you here other than your life? Is you just give up on life now and just you need to tell somebody what happened, basically, right? I guess, yeah. Your insights is your. You you want to do one thing, but your insights tells you more, like your heart, right? You're talking out of your heart. You, know? you feel sorry you did this to your mom? In a way, yes, but I wouldn't take <coughs> back what I did. It's strange, really. Mm -hmm. I did love her, in a way. Uh, Can uh, she be mean to me? To oh, me? no, no. She's been the best mother. Okay, so she did nothing that she did? To oh, absolutely nothing, no. She if I was to ask you, what did she do to deserve this, what would you answer? Absolutely nothing. I'm just, I'm a terrible... I'm a cruel, cool, disgusting person. Yeah, the key quote from all of this is when he says, quote, I wouldn't take back what I did, unquote. Most killers, after they've been caught and arrested, aren't necessarily remorseful about what they did, but they tend to regret doing it afterwards as it caused them to go to jail and have their freedom stripped as a result. Kevin's plan from the start was to kill himself. And by his own words, he had nothing to lose. And if you pair this lack of care with a lust to kill, you have a disaster in the making. Kevin, despite knowing he's in the wrong, and after he's gotten out of his fit of rage, which triggered him to do it in the first place, says he would have done it again given the chance. This brutal honesty and lack of any guilt shows just how much Kevin's personality is fabricated. The calm, polite, and reasonable behavior is completely falsified. It doesn't exist. Inside Kevin's mind is devoid of any emotion pertaining to morality. He exists as a purely logical machine without a moral compass to stop him. Kevin acts like a normal person because he's been trained how. It's how he can seem so normal and nonchalant when discussing everything he did. Serial killers I've analyzed in the past, like Richard Ramirez, Ed Kemper, or Ted Bundy, have all shown emotion when discussing their murders. They may not show what we would deem normal emotions, but they do give off nonverbal communications when discussing what they did. We would consider these behaviors abnormal because, well, we're not all serial killers, but they do exhibit emotional responses and body language, which is normal for people. Where I hope you or I would feel guilt and remorse for killing, serial killers would feel powerful, excited, or lustful. But in the case of Kevin, he feels nothing. His nonverbal communication gives off nothing. How'd you come up with the idea to kill her and have sex with her? Is it, is it, How did I come up with it? Yeah, was it? It's been a developing just, idea. Uh, in my brain. Mm -hmm. But you haven't gotten ideas from games or videos, or you're not into uh, uh, some of those uh, dark games? Some things inspired me, but they did not necessarily plant the seed. Mm -hmm. you get me? They didn't plant the seed, but they did egg me on, rather, I is, guess. Is that the books you've been reading? Not necessarily. I watched them. I got, actually, I recently got into watching some of uh, some foreign movies, creepy stuff, not oh. necessarily mainstream horror, the oh. kind of stuff that you keep away from. Oh, okay. okay. So are you into witchcraft? Anything mm, like that? No. Not right. I guess it sounds kind of um, strange. I'm, I'm just interested because it's something unusual and you're here telling us about it and you appear to be a nice guy. You appear to be a good guy. You know, you're, you know, you're not yelling and screaming you at us. You seem very you're rational. You're, you're very rational. You appear uh, to be a good guy. This is what I'm trying to figure out. That's all. Uh, well, despite how I ended her life, I'm kind of more fascinated by the more artistic ways of murder, a meticulous manner, the way they cut them open and just slice them to pieces with, I mean, such care, such love. And where did the, where did the hammer come from that you used? From her drawer. Okay. Yes. And then after you killed her, you just left it there, the hammer? I did. Yes. Yeah, you saw a hammer there next to her body. That's, that's the one you used? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, there was some blood in the knife, but you said you never used it? I guess just blood just from where you grabbed it around the... Oh, that knife. Actually, I used that to stir her brains up a little, but then that didn't really work out, so I just kind of decided to delve on it. Did you do that head. in the living room or the bedroom? Because we found that in the... it wasn't in the bedroom. Did I may have started that. So yeah, actually, I used the knife in the living room, and then I... didn't I take it with me? So the, her brains were already kind of coming out when in the living room when you dragged it? 
Yes, but she was still snoring like a baby, and so I just kind of dragged her. Explain to her how you grabbed her so that you wouldn't leave such a mess in, in the carpet. That. Did you carry her from underneath the arms and just dragged her, or how did you drag her? It was very sloppy, actually. Yeah. I kind of just winged it. I dragged her from her shirt. I dragged her by her legs. I dragged her by any way I kind of fell. I mean, okay, okay. I don't really exert physical labor to mm -hmm. so I'm not a very strong person. She's bigger than you are. Yeah. yeah. She's a little bigger than you are. How so many uh, siblings do you have? Is it just you and Des Desiree? I do have a half brother, actually, but yes. I haven't seen him in a long while. Does he live here in town or no? He doesn't. Okay. What about dad? What is dad? In? He never. He's not in the picture. Your dad? Or? Uh, no, not really. He's he's an idiot. He's a he's an idiot. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea where he's at? <sighs> Probably somewhere in Fort Worth, maybe. Mm -hmm. And you live there with your mom at the Windrush Apartments. What's the apartment number? Seventeen. Okay. Seventeen or seven. Uh, which you have a, your own bedroom there? I do. Okay. All right. So the note where you wrote the plan that you were going to leave town and kill your mom, kill your sister, that was the one that we found it. We found it in one of the bedrooms, not where your mom was, but the other one. That's your. That was your room. Yeah, that two bedroom room apartment. Was the big blank, yeah. sloppy looking. Yeah. Okay. And, but your sister didn't live with you guys. She didn't. Okay. There was a magic marker there on top of the little desk here in your room. A magic marker. Like permanent like marker. Like a marker. Permanent permanent marker. Okay, permanent marker, yeah. yes. Yeah. Is that the one you used? It was on a little like folding table. Uh, uh, is that where you wrote your notes? I think I just grabbed a piece of my, like, my old schoolwork and just kind of... How do you do in schoolwork? Going back to school, how do you do in schoolwork? Pretty mediocre. I never really... I never really could muster to yeah. even really care. I mean, I guess I excelled in English for all that was worth. Okay. How about uh, sports? No, I, I don't like sports. You don't like sports? Football? I know, that. I know you're a little small for football, but... Oh. Yeah. What school did you go to? Ray High School. Ray? And you went 10th grade? Yeah. Alright. Yeah. Did you ever yeah. tell anybody else what your plans were? Uh, that, you know, what you wanted to do your mom or your sister? No, but over the years there were hints. As a younger boy, I was a a lot dumber, a lot more angsty, you know. I said things, but I guess they basically brushed it off. I guess the hints were everywhere, but they're my family. Mm -hmm. Family looks past that kind of stuff, or they try to not look at it, mm -hmm. I guess. Let me ask you, at this point, what do you consider yourself? You consider yourself, I'm going to use a dirty word, okay, but I, I, don't, mean oh. to, I don't mean to insult you, no, okay? No. Do you consider you mentally disturbed? Do you consider yourself crazy? Do you, or do you consider yourself any of those? Or do you think you're okay? Do you just got some bad thoughts? I'm not mentally disturb disturbed. I mean, I'm sane. I know exactly what I did. I know that it's wrong in the, tradi in the traditional no. sense of wrong. Hello. It was just a fantasy you had, and yeah. you had to carry it out. Carry it out. Yeah. Not yet. Now I feel vaguely um, right. Right. kind of like I'm done. Mm -hmm. So. You still feel like, they, well, you're done with your mom. You still feel like you want to keep on killing? To keep on, you know, with other fantasies? Or, or how do you feel? I came here to pay for my crime, so I guess I should continue with the truth. Mm -hmm. Truthfully. Yes, definitely. I would kill again. Mm -hmm. Kevin says he's done. He's acted out his fantasy and now he's done everything he wanted to do. He said before that he wants to die and has no attempt to come across as a person who is able to be rehabilitated. Interestingly enough, Kevin actually pled not guilty at trial which came as a shock to everyone as the full and extensive tape exists of him going into graphic detail about the crimes he committed. His lawyer also pleaded for a lesser sentence due to Kevin's diagnosis of ASPD, which he was denied. Suicide mortality rates are far higher for people with personality disorders, especially people who have been diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, with antisocial personality traits being very common in populations who have committed offenses and in forensic psychiatric patients. Suicidal behavior is more prevalent in individuals with higher levels of antisocial traits, borderline traits, and narcissistic traits. It is clear that the root cause of this apathy to death and killing 
killing is due to his neurological disorder as opposed to a lack of knowledge of morality. As Kevin demonstrates, he is fully aware of right and wrong. And up until 18, he never committed even the smallest of criminal acts. It was only when he argued with his mother that his murderous side was brought out. And one of the main symptoms of ASPD is that they can get triggered by events such as these, causing them to act irrationally and immorally. I think you want to kill us. Oh, no, rabbit men aren't my thing, actually. Women? Yeah. Okay, uh, 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 do you have a girlfriend? I don't, you I've don't? never had a girlfriend. Never had a girlfriend. I'll tell you what, give me your fancy of killing a woman. Oh, your fancy killing would be, your age killing, what could that be? This is a little peculiar, I'm on camera. Okay, um. <laughs> I'm not surprised at what I'm going to hear, but uh, you tell me. Maybe dressing up in a nice suit, sneaking into her house, disabling her boyfriend. You know, yeah, I, I'd bring a pretty dress with me to dress her up in. I, I was always into strangling, but after after that last um, blunder, I guess maybe something big and sharp would be more along uh, more along my thing. Mm -hmm. And I could, I don't know, probably decapitate her, as I, I prefer my women dead. Um, okay. I'd dress her up. I'd stitch her up. Kind of just kind of try to work the head back on, perhaps. And um, then I'd go to town, and it would be a night to remember. Mm -hmm. And then I'd kind of just burn everything and run for the hills. Now you, you mentioned that you lost your virginity to a corpse. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that, what happened? Oh, well, just last night, my mother, yeah. Okay, you, not somebody else. You talked yeah. about your mom. Yes. Okay, so before that, you had never had sex. Well, uh, I guess since I'm being yeah. quiet about it, I might as well tell you now. I Yeah, and it's on the note, too, the P.S. part. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to have a gray cat named um, Claire. Oh, yeah, bestiality is a thing of mine, too, mm -hmm. now, now you know. And so I... Um, I strangled it, I drowned it, and then I cut it open, and you know the rest, mm. kind of get the rest. You had sex with a cat, with a dead cat? Cool. Yeah, ripped it open, stuck it in there, yeah. Mm. Uh, you, you ever had sex with a live person? No. It is a small detail, but Kevin is visibly shy and timid about talking about his fantasy killing on camera. He again shows great concern over his self-image, despite admitting to and committing one of the most horrific crimes. He does what is called a distancing behavior. In body language, a distancing behavior is the way someone's brain tries to get them to avoid or distance themselves from something that causes them stress. And when body language experts see these behaviors, that notifies them that the suspect is feeling stress from what's being said. They can then use that reaction to pry more to determine why the suspect is feeling this stress. Distancing behaviors are what I term social behaviors. They only apply socially between humans. As looking away from a cliff or a wolf isn't going to stop it from killing you, it's actually going to make it worse. These behaviors actually help us in our social interactions. Too much eye contact is considered aggressive and too little is considered shy and timid. One is more dominant and one is more submissive. We have evolved to distance to notify others that we are not a challenge to them. If you're having an argument, for example, and someone gets right up in your face, most of the time you'll look down and distance, letting that person know that you mean no threat to them. This is precisely what Kevin's doing here. When he appears shy about talking about his fantasy killing, he distances and looks down as he feels exposed and vulnerable talking about it, showing that he does feel something. He fears social embarrassment and he exhibits genuine human reactions when the embarrassment becomes a possibility. This is in stark contrast to when talking about the terrible crimes he committed. He is devoid of any feelings of remorse, regret or guilt. Yeah. So that your thing, uh, uh, having sex with a live person that doesn't turn you on, it's a uh, dead, dead thing, dead person, dead animals, that's what turns you on? I don't necessarily mind. I don't have standards or morals. Mm -hmm. Body's a body in, in the end, it's a piece of meat. I guess it's harsh to say, but 
Mm-hmm. But no, I don't necessarily mind. How about the idea of hurting yourself? Do you have the same idea now? Huh? Do you have the same idea that you want to hurt yourself, commit suicide? No, it's all for me. I'm it's just going to I'll say the music, whatever happens, happens. Yeah. There's not a happy ending for me. Definitely. Well, let's tell me, what do you think should happen to you? What do you think your punishment should be? Uh, whatever the judge, the people, the jury deems fit, I can rot, I can suffer for years, or I can be given the death penalty, whatever they think is for me. Mm. What do you think you deserve? Killing your mom? I deserve sex with your mom? But I just deserve to rot and suffer. Mm. I mean, it just it is what it is. Okay, I want to give you some options here. Okay. 10 years probation, 20 years in the pen, 100 years in the pen. What do you prefer from those series? Name them again. Probation, 10 years. 20, 10 years in the pen, 50 years, 100 years in the pen. 100. The, the maximum. But I suppose, I mean, I, I, mean, I admire your mind, man. You, you, you don't sit here and try to baby yourself to death. Came here to face the music, I guess, just got to. Yeah, right. Uh, Thank you, brother, man. Anything else you want to add? Uh, about what happened that's important that we should know? Not really. I'm mm-hmm. sure interested in other colorful details. Have you ever heard your sister? No, I haven't. No. Anybody else? No. She didn't ever kill anybody else or anything else? Oh, no. Yeah, that was my first. Was, uh, you ever been on Blucher Street? Hmm? Oh, you ever been on Blucher Street? Uh, is he referring like Blucher to Street? Blucher Street. Blucher Street. You know where Blucher Park is? I uh, haven't. It's a large area of uh, Karankawa, Tonkawa. It's down the street here in the uptown area. I had a, a woman that was killed in, uh, back then. Uh, so. Oh, no, not me. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is the first time you're saying, right? That you killed somebody? Yeah. A person, not an animal? <coughs> yes. Do you want to know what's going to happen to you now? Oh, sure. Okay, it's very simple. You're going to be booked at the, uh, the county. At first, you're taking the city facility, you charged with murder. Then you will be uh, uh, transferred over to the county, where, of course, uh, you'll go to the county jail. They'll set a bond for you and everything else, and if you can afford to get out of jail, then that means so be it. And if you can't, you sit there and jump to your trial. Okay? You, the trial, you can plead not guilty, and you can go to trial and let a jury decide if you're guilty or not. Or you may be able to cut a deal with a district attorney for whatever time you, you want to cut a, cut a deal for. Okay? Spare the, spare the jury. You know, uh, in a jury, uh, of course, a, a jury of 12, you probably might have several women or several men. The thing to remember is all those people have had mothers in the past. And they, and they may not be too proud of you. Oh, of course. I don't expect people to think very highly of me after this. Hey. But, but like I said, I, I admire you for your honesty. You were honest with us, and, and you didn't try to push us. Okay, and, and, and you're like a man. You came out here and, and took it like a man. So, uh, the investigator on the right is very different to the investigator on the left and their body language reveals exactly what they're thinking and feeling. The interrogator on the right attempts to steeple his fingers on the desk, which is a sign of confidence, but he soon starts rubbing his hands together. This is what happens when someone tries to pretend to be confident, but is anything but. People try to steeple their fingers to look like they're in control, but then they soon start moving their hands again as the stress builds up. He then moves his hands off the table and interlocks them, eventually holding them in a fist later on. Interlocked fingers are commonly associated with emotional stress and insecurity, and hands held in a fist is a very common sign of aggression. The interrogator on the right is very stressed by Kevin's presence, and he clearly holds significant levels of aggression against him. The issue is as an interrogator you have to be calm and collected and even friendly with a suspect in order not to compromise them giving up information. It's why they're so friendly to him and why they positioned him deliberately nearer to the door. They want him to feel in control and that they have no hostility towards them. This is likely why Kevin gave up so much information that he and his lawyer would contradict during the trial. 
The interrogator on the left even shakes hands with Kevin at one point. He appears to me to be the more seasoned interrogator and has learned not to let his emotions slip. And the handshake is again an attempt by him to make Kevin feel at ease and to give him a false sense of security. Buttering up murderers is a common tactic and has resulted in numerous crimes being solved due to this false sense of security. This tactic was pioneered by World War II German Luftwaffe interrogator Hans Schaff, who when tasked with interrogating US prisoners would pretend to be their friend and that he only wanted what's best for them. He would take them on long walks around gardens, spending a lot of time building up a relationship with his prisoners. He would tell them after some time that he didn't want to interrogate them, but if they couldn't provide him with the necessary information, his superiors would assume that he's a spy and turn him over to the Gestapo. He would ask prisoners questions he already knew the answer to, informing them that he already knew everything about them, but his superiors had given instructions that the prisoner himself had to say it. He continued asking the questions he knew the answers to, each time hoping to convince the prisoners that there was nothing that he already didn't know. He then would eventually question them about something he didn't know the answer to, but the prisoners would assume that he already know them, and so they gave up valuable information that he didn't know. These are all tactics used across the world to this day in criminal investigations. Well, a man he came across like a man. I mean, uh, not like somebody else. He, he came across like him. He did what you did, and he came to the city. Man, I admire a man like that. I, I work, I work this kind of stuff all the time, and, and and you get a lot of time, but a lot of time people all of a sudden did something, and all they all they want to do is move out of it. You want to take responsibility. You're a different person. My life's taking a different turn. I forgot the name of it. Kevin has been behind bars at the Jester facility in Richmond, Texas since he was found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison for his crimes. According to his prison records, he will be eligible for parole in March of 2044. During the interrogation, he confessed to everything and was later charged with first degree murder. But then in June of that year, he bizarrely pleaded not guilty when he was trialed in court. He then changed his plea in the end, not that it made any difference as his entire detailed confession that we've just witnessed was already on tape and was shown to the jurors. The defense called no witnesses during the trial and when his lawyer applied for a lighter sentence due to the diagnosis of ASPD, the prosecution stated that they had seen absolutely no medical evidence of any mental or emotional illness despite Kevin being diagnosed as having ASPD during the trial. It took the jury no more than an hour to come back with the sentence of life in prison. Kevin is fully aware of right and wrong, but due to his personality disorder, he had a complete disregard for it. He knows what he did was wrong in every way. And he even claimed to love his mother, but he still has no remorse. All it took was a fatal argument to trigger Kevin to murder Kimberly Hill.